Good morning and welcome to worship at Grace United Methodist Church. Today is the first Sunday of Lent. We began to gather a journey toward Jesus' cross. I am the Reverend Amy McCullough, lead pastor here at Grace, and joining me in worship today are Pastor Dane Woods, our associate pastor, Mr. Chris Schroeder, our minister of music, and our lay readers and section soloists. We are glad that you are here, as together we direct our prayers and praise to God. Now you'll notice that today's service is a pre-recorded one. Late in the week, we learned of a potential COVID exposure. And so in an abundance of caution, moved to recording all of the pieces of worship, including those we had been doing in our live stream. I thank those who worked behind the scenes to make this last minute change possible. And for the gift of being able to be together virtually for worship. Now I want to share with you a few announcements as we begin our time together. First, a huge thank you to all of you who donated food to our canned food drive this past month with our Boy Scout uh, to benefit Gedco Cares Food Pantry. Your generosity, as is so often the case, was amazing, and it provides needed nourishment to households throughout the city. Thank you. Next, our Lenten study begins this Wednesday evening. Our group will be delving into Mark's Gospel, finding there this compelling presence of Jesus and asking what it means for our lives today. It's not too late to join our Lenten study, and if you'd like to do so, you may contact me for more information. Our class gathers for four Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Next Sunday is Gospel Music Sunday. I'm so thrilled that we will be able to continue this cherished tradition at Grace. Music will be led by Robert Cantrell, our bass soloist, and Mr. Chris Schroeder. There'll be selections from our chancel choir and some special soloists. Because of the multiple elements to the service, worship will be on Zoom rather than our normal Facebook and YouTube platforms. I want to repeat that. Worship next Sunday is on Zoom. We'll send out the information about joining the Zoom link on our Thursday e-notes and again on early Sunday morning. We want everyone to be able to participate, so if you're new to Zoom and want some pointers, please reach out to the church office. I hope you'll join us for Gospel Music Sunday next Sunday at 10 a.m. Thank you for your generosity to Grace. We are grateful for your continued faithfulness and your offerings. If you'd like to give today, you may do so online using our giving portal on our website. And of course, you may always mail in your offering or drop it by the church office. And now we gather to worship. I invite you to find a candle to light it. and to invite God into your heart and your home. Let us worship together.
please rise in spirit for our greeting. To you, O Lord, we lift up our souls. To you, Lord, we open our hearts. Search us, O God, and know our thoughts. Try us, O God, and lead us in your truth. We trust in you, O Lord. You, O God, will guide us into the everlasting way. Let us pray together. God of Covenant, as the forty days of rain swept away the world's corruption and watered new beginnings of life, so in the saving flood of baptism are we washed clean and born anew. Throughout the forty days of Lent, unseal within us the wellspring of your grace. Cleanse our hearts of all that is not holy and cause your gift of new life to flourish once again. Amen. Now I invite you to join in our prayer of confession. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the Spirit to follow in the way of Jesus, as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Amen. Now, as a people forgiven by Jesus Christ, let us share that love with one another by sharing the peace of Christ. May the peace of the Lord be with you.
Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may the spirit of God rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. Please join with me for our Psalter, which comes from Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. It is page 756 in the United Methodist Hymnal. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Let none that wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are clothed with treachery. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore the Lord instructs sinners in the way and leads the humble in what is right and teaches them their way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. For those who keep the Lord's covenant and testimonies. Amen. Our second reading is from Mark chapter 1 verses 9 through 15. At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Each week, Pastor Dean and I preach from an empty sanctuary. It is a strange thing to do. Pastor Dean, I'm sure, has his strategies for addressing the oddness. Mine is simple. I imagine that you are here. I survey the pews looking at each section of this four 
quadrant space. Remembering who likes to sit where, what time you arrive, and offering a prayer for your current life. It's no secret that we are creatures of habit. So some persons get here early to listen to the gathering music. Some slip in the side sanctuary door after making a stop at Sunday school. Some scoot in the back door right as the opening hymn begins. Most of us have a cherished pew. Can you find yours? In the wilderness of the past year, the familiar patterns of worship have been altered. We have had to discover new ways of making sacred the space we still share together. It is a wilderness time. Now, by definition, a wilderness conjures up images of a desolate place a pathway devoid of familiar markers, if marked at all. If you're walking in the sand, the footsteps ahead of you, or even the ones you just made behind you, are quickly erased. If you are walking across a desert, then water is your most valuable asset, along with a shading hat. A wilderness space is a transitional one because few of us want to make a permanent home here when there are more inhabitable geographies. Traveling through the wilderness arouses one's survival instincts. If you're familiar with it, think of the Great Salt Desert in Utah which rendered the impulsive travels of early settlers foolish. Or think of the desert in Arizona, where many have lost their way. In the wilderness, one's alertness is sharpened by the reality of strangeness and by the possibility of death. And someone, somewhere, travels such a wilderness today. Now, wilderness describes a geography, but it's also a spiritual state. I'm in the wilderness, we might confess. I feel cut off from God. I feel rent asunder from my old identity. I sense that I'm being tested, forced to struggle apart from what has felt comfortable or good about my life. The inclination is to equate such a landscape with God's absence. But scripture testifies to a different story. In Genesis, when Abraham cast out Sarah's servant Hagar, and their son Ishmael cast them out into the wilderness, Hagar prepares to die. But she is visited by God, God who enables their survival. Generations later, the Israelites are led by Moses into the wilderness. And their 40 years there is a crucial journey toward freedom, guided by God. And then Jesus baptized 
with the voice of God saying, you are my son, still ringing in his ears. Today is driven by the spirit into the wilderness. The wilderness can be a meeting place for us with God. Now last week in his sermon, Pastor Dane prepared us for Lent, suggesting that this season is a time to take a holy pause, to find those moments for where, to create those moments where we can find ourselves before God. His sermon partnered with today's scripture about Jesus and the wilderness, got me to think about those spiritual spaces where we struggle in front of God. As some of you know, I was born without the ability to hear in my right ear. I've lived with this partial deafness my entire life. And often I've marveled at the brain's ability to compensate for such a sensory loss. Being deaf in one, me one ear means that I have never cared much for loud spaces, be they dance clubs or pep rallies or stadium-filled concerts. Being deaf in my right ear means that if you speak to me from the side and I'm not aware of your presence, I might miss hearing you, which as a pastor is never my intention. But by far the biggest hurdle has come in learning how to speak. Without the full ability to imitate other speech, to fully hear them and learn by imitating. As a kid, I had to learn the mechanics of speech, where to place my tongue for those tricky sounds like R's and S's and SH's. And when I was younger, this challenge, which by no means is a life or death precipice, created a strange and at times alienating space within me. I would wonder, why is something that looks so easy for so many so hard for me? Why do I have to work at something that comes naturally? For most. I suspect every one of us has had a space in our lives where we feel cast out from the familiar or the expected, exiled from the normal into a more difficult space. Each of us might encounter something where we wonder, why do I have to work so hard? at something that comes easily for most. Why am I walking this rough road when others can take a smooth byway? The Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness, beyond security, safety, or the comfort of others. Here, Jesus faces the temptations of Satan, the presence of wild beasts. He ekes out a survival for 40 days, a length reminiscent of Israel's 40 years of wilderness wandering. We don't know precisely what wilderness was like for Jesus what he encountered in that rough road. But let's imagine for a moment a, thre a threadbare tent with the entrance flap slapping in the fierce wind. A fire kept small for safety. Days when silence dominates, except for the coyotes howling at night, or the mountain lions pacing the encampment, the occasional flap of a hawk's wings. 
Satan, that personification of all the forces opposing God, tempts from the edges. You don't have to follow the path laid out for you. You could take a smooth way back. Grab the glory of being God's son and run for the nearest synagogue to cash it in for a prestigious post. Comfort, safety, power, all these things can be yours. Day after day, Jesus must look across that desolate landscape, take in these temptations, and ask, am I up to the task? And in the end, to embrace with greater awareness his solidarity with a despairing people. Mark doesn't tell us if Jesus ever wavered in his testing, if there was a day that Jesus thought about packing up and going back into a comfortable civilization. Instead, Mark focuses upon the angels who waited upon Jesus amid his struggles. There were angels with him in the desert. And maybe those angels sprinkled his skin with water as the sun scorched down. Maybe they touched his forehead with their wings in hopes of helping him release the tension. Maybe they sang a lullaby to drown out the howling wind, the pacing lions, a tiny hark to signal his suffering was not being endured alone. Because at the end of the 40 days, Jesus does emerge, resolute in his vocation, to embrace the hard road and desolate moments experienced by you and I in order to forge a new path for humanity, in order to create a community of belovedness made whole by a cross rather than by an easy victory. When I first sensed a call into ministry, I didn't think about the fact that such a vocation would require a fair measure of public speaking. I closed myself off from that obvious reality. It felt ironic to me that God might use the parts of me that felt the most vulnerable And frankly, embracing my vocation has meant more work, more vulnerability, more bumping up against the limitations that come with being a mortal, fallible human being. This, I think, is the spiritual work of Lent. As preacher Christopher Henry says, Lent begins in the wilderness. It is the place where pretense fades away and honest vulnerability becomes possible. In the wilderness, we are unable to keep up the public image of effortless perfection that plagues too many of us. We are free to confess the messy reality of our lives. I don't know where the present wilderness is taking us, when or how we will emerge from it. But out here in the wilderness, some truths are bubbling up to the surface. The first is that spiritual freedom comes with being honest about our mortality, our vulnerability to any kind of brokenness. 
The past year, I pray, has brought us closer together in our common struggle. The pain of the past year has shown us our interdependence, how one's wholeness depends upon another's, how my health depends upon yours. Let's commit to being honest with one another. Let's commit to admitting that there are days we are just holding it together, that there are places that need hard work. And let's trust that in this wilderness, there are angels bending down to shelter us through. A second truth emerges from Jesus' wrestling with Satan, symbolic of his struggle against those things that oppose God. As Matthew Skinner notes, the antagonists in Mark's gospel are not human ignorance or even religious political authority. They are spiritual forces. Things that oppress human bodies and minds and defy human attempts to subdue them. The wilderness of today invites a similar recognition. As we try to make sense of the inequity exposed in the past year, be it in healthcare or education, and the disproportionate suffering placed upon some lives. We have to see that we wrestle against forces larger than us. By going into the wilderness, Jesus takes up that struggle. And may this Lent be a time that we keep wrestling, while also claiming the power of Christ to defeat all that defies God. And lastly, living alert to vulnerability and to larger forces has made me freer in my expressions of love. Simply put, I'm more willing to say, I love you where I'm sending you my love. In the end, love is what matters, and love is what will see us through. Jesus' life with us is God saying to all of humankind, I love you. I love you so much that I will not leave you alone in the struggle. I will not leave you unaided. I'm aware of your vulnerability. I sense those larger forces that work against me. Here, I'm sending you my love. Wrapped in a man capable of wrestling in the wilderness and emerging resolute in his vocation to redeem us all. There is no more powerful force than love. And our primary vocation is to be those who love like God. And so as we begin Lent, where are you before God? What vulnerabilities need to be named? What evils need to be resisted? What love needs to be absorbed. The sanctuary may be empty, but the Holy Spirit knows no boundaries. There are no distances that God cannot close. May we together observe a holy Lent. Amen. Let us come together now to pray for the church and the world. 
We pray together saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth and live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them, and love one another as Christ loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for Mary, Joseph, Anita, Doris, Greg, Robert, Judy, Steve, Jim, Ed, Anika, Walt, Marguerite, Margaret, and all those we name in the comments, as well as all those we hold on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy, O Lord, all who have died, Laura and Lee, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all of your saints and your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray all these prayers, Lord, and those unsaid, knowing that you hear us even when we do not speak. Now we pray the way Christ has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
now receive this blessing. May the love of God enfold you. May the grace of Jesus Christ guide your way. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit offer you comfort, community in these days. You are loved by God, held in God's embrace. Go in peace to love and serve God. Amen. Thank you.